and designated to promote, to, 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 to preside over the court, must say a pledge that um, he or she will promote and protect the values uh, enshrined in the constitution. Next slide, please. Next slide, Celia. Um, clause six of the bill chair deals with the nature of uh, traditional courts. And the bill provides that these traditional courts are courts of law, the aim of which is to promote the equitable and fair resolution of disputes and in a manner that is in, underpinned by the value system applicable in customary law and custom. But most importantly, that function in terms of the constitution. Um, traditional courts do not function as courts referred to in chapter eight of the constitution. And their emphasis is on preventing conflict, maintaining harmony, and resolving disputes in a manner that promotes restorative justice, social cohesion, and reconciliation in the uh, or among the members of the community. So this courts, unlike our you know ordinary courts, they use the restorative justice uh, methods uh, rather than the uh, retributive uh, methods as used in ordinary courts. Um, Chair, I've already indicated that the traditional justice system is made of uh, the levels um, as I've already alluded to, and that is provided for in clause six of the bill. I've also mentioned that a new, there has been a development in terms of which a level that was not provided for in the traditional leadership and governance framework act has now been introduced with that of a principal traditional leader. And that will also feature, that will feature when explaining the, uh, the proposed amendments from, from the NCOP. Next slide, please. Um, <coughs> sorry. Regarding the, the, the clause seven of the bill, which deals with the procedure that's applicable in traditional courts, the bill prop, uh, extends uh, the guiding principles in clause three by building in safeguards for the protection and assistance of persons with vulnerabilities, particularly women as litigants and as members of the court. Um, including the elderly, the youth, the indigent, persons with disabilities. So it's persons who have all those uh, vulnerabilities, including uh, the uh, persons from the LGBTIQ uh, community. Um, the safeguards as contained in the bill amongst others uh, are that the proceedings of the court must be open to all the members of the community and the court must be held at a place which is accessible to members of the community. The proceedings must be conducted in the presence of both parties and the parties must be able to participate fully without any discrimination on any of the prohibited grounds as mentioned in uh, section nine of the constitution. Next slide, please. Um, it is important to know that uh, any failure to comply with the procedural as aspects as uh, uh, provided for in the bill or any procedural matter uh, can lead to a matter being taken on review uh, to the High Court. The bill also provides for the for, for the position of provincial registrars uh, who will be required to assist 
uh, as one of their functions to assist the aggrieved uh, litigants to take matters on review. Chair, although the bill does not permit legal representation in traditional courts, uh, parties are allowed to be assisted by any person of their choice in whom they have confidence. So a party is allowed to bring anyone, be it a neighbor a, or a relative, anyone that a person has confidence in that will, uh, the party is confident that that person will take their interest uh, uh, to heart uh, to represent that person. Um, there, there, there seems to be consensus that uh, legal representation uh, or, or, or rather the traditional justice system does not lend itself to the use of legal representatives. Next slide, please. Clause eight um, deals with orders that a traditional court may make. And the members will uh, take note that the orders as proposed in clause eight are a, a restorative in nature uh, rather than being uh, retributive. For example, the bill does not allow the imposition of fines uh, and, and you know, uh, things like uh, deprivation of customary law benefits and um, because a concern has been raised that this uh, imposition of this type of retributive uh, 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 orders could lead to abuses uh, within the system or, you know, perpetuate the alleged abuse in the system. Um, rather, the, 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 the orders that are proposed in the bill um, are, include a, or, or are orders that a, are able to give redress. A, you know, also a, orders such as compensation can be, can be ordered because then a, the party would need to be restored in the position that it was in. And the, the payment of cons compensation may not exceed the, uh, the value of the damage that gave rise to the dispute or the amount that the minister may uh, have determined uh, by notice in the Gazette. Um, another order that is proposed in the bill is that of community service. Uh, however, as a safeguard, the community service may not be for the good of the traditional leader or any uh, member of the court or a relation of the traditional leader, but it should rather be for the benefit and good of the, of the, of the, the community. Next slide, please. Clause nine of the bill chair deals with the enforcement of orders of the traditional court. The bill builds in a mechanism in terms of, uh, for, for, for purposes of ensuring that the, the orders of the traditional court are complied with uh, and the, the, the mechanism that is proposed in the bill is that if a party fails to comply with an order of the court, the aggrieved party can approach a, a clerk of the court and who will try and mediate between the, 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 the parties more uh, towards the parties against whom an order has been uh, made to comply with the order. If that fails, then the clerk of the court uh, may refer the matter to 
to the justice of the peace uh, appointed in terms of the justices of the peace and commissioner of oaths act of 1963. Uh, then the justice of the peace will then deal with the matter in terms of the powers that uh, he or she has in terms of the justices of the peace act next slide please clause 10 provides for the appointment of um of of a uh, traditional court registrars that I've already alluded to. And the bill also sets out the role, uh, the, 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 the functions of this uh, position, uh, which would be among others to compile and maintain a register of all traditional courts in the province, uh, referring matters of public interest to the high court so that uh, the decisions in terms of uh, those matters can contribute to the uh, jurisprudence and enhance the reform of customary law. And the registrar uh, will also be responsible for transferring cases in respect of which traditional courts or a traditional court does not have jurisdiction, uh, where such a matter will then be transferred to the appropriate court. And the, he or she will also be required to assist the parties and, and uh, most importantly, to guide and supervise the functioning of the traditional courts as, uh, you know, the, 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 these courts will now be functioning differently to how they've been functioning because they have to align their functioning with the, the, the principles of the constitution. Next slide, please. Clause 11 of the bill provides for a review to the High Court. Uh, uh, as a matter of course, a uh, review will be in respect of any procedural uh, shortcomings and it will be to the High Court, like I've mentioned that, that will uh, assist in enhancing the a customary law and also building a precedence on customary law and the functioning or, or, or rather the traditional justice system. Um, and once a matter has been referred on, taken on review, then the High Court can either confirm, alter, set aside or correct the order that the, the uh, traditional court made. Um, and it can also, uh, you know, order the traditional court to to deal with the matter in a specific way. You know, the uh, a normal review uh, a, a function of the court. Um, uh, next slide, please. Clause twelve chair deals with. A referral of matters from the from the traditional court to the magistrate court, and this is different to the review a, a procedure that I've been talking about because the review will be on procedural shortcomings, uh, but uh, the referral in terms of clause twelve uh, will be. Uh, in terms of the, in, in a prescribed manner and, and period after a person has exhausted the, 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 the uh, appeal procedures at, uh, at customary in terms of traditional justice system. Um, and this referral, which is also an appeal procedure may not be um, lost in respect of uh, procedural shortcomings. Clause 16 of the bill provides for the minister to compile a code of conduct uh, that will regulate the role uh, 
or, or, or regulate the conduct of those having a role to play in the traditional courts and how any breach to the of, of the code uh, must be dealt with. Um, this clause uh, chair on 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 um, the code of conduct I'll uh, talk to again when explaining the amendments as proposed by the NCOP. Uh, clause 18 also, uh, which um, contains transitional provisions and um, give guidance on how matters that are already pending before the court, uh, before a traditional court will be dealt with, uh, will also be relevant for purposes of uh, the amendments proposed in the in the NCOP. Next slide, please. Um, the bill also provides for the keeping of uh, records of the traditional courts, the transfer of uh, disputes uh, from the traditional court to, say, a magistrate court, or from the magistrate's court to the traditional court, as the case may be. It also uh, provides for the immunity or limitation of liability of members of the traditional court um, and uh, the code of conduct of the of, of the members of the court I've already uh, spoken to. Uh, and uh, clause 17, which deals with the regulations, require the minister to make regulations on the training of traditional leaders as well as members of the traditional court um, and the involvement and training of paralegals and, and intents in the functioning of traditional courts. Um, Chair, that is the, what the traditional courts bill uh, seeks to do and what uh, it provides for. Um, Chair, uh, I'll need guidance as to whether I should then proceed to the amendments as proposed by the NCOP or whether the, the members would like to engage on the presentation uh, first. I see there's a hand of the Honorable Horn, Honorable Breitenbach, Honorable Nivot Drachans. Uh, how long are those amendments from the NCOP? How long will how, how long will they take us? Not very long, Chair, because I've already spoken to some of them. It will just be quickly to to explain uh, them because it's only it's in respect of say one, two, three, four, five, six clauses, and or, or maybe even five because the other one is similar or or rather even four, because there the definition of, it, of the traditional leader, F, as I've already spoken to, and the number of the, the short title there, the number of, of 2019, changing it to 2020 features, but even the other ones are just very uh, minimal. Ross, about Ross, four. Yeah, Mr. Ross, um, will you be able to explain everything in six minutes? Yes, sir. Uh, members, can we just uh, bear with her for six more minutes, and then we will be able to engage with a comprehensive uh, presentation. Is that fine, members? Yes. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ross. You have six minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, sir, can you please put up the the, the uh, second document on the traditional courts. Okay. Um, there is a proposed amendment with regard to the definition of a traditional leader, and it is uh, the same def uh, um, explanation that I provided in respect of the customary law. Um, customary marriages amendment bill also applies here. So there, the same meaning that is uh, 
used in respect of that recognition of customary marriages that takes into consideration that the traditional leadership and governance framework act is now being repealed also uh, is relevant here. And the other proposal in respect of that talks to the deletion of the definition in the definitions in clause one of traditional leadership and governance framework act because that act is no longer relevant because it is not now not referred to in the in the bill and the second um uh, uh, proposed amendment is in respect of clause six which provides amongst others for the levels of traditional leadership and there the the uh, the, the, the reference to traditional leadership and governance framework uh, act uh, is uh, omitted and secondly the clause because the uh, the traditional and Khoisan Act uh, brings in another level of traditional leadership, that of a pr principal traditional leader. That is another uh, a proposed uh, definite uh, proposed change that uh, the levels in the bill also uh, take cognizance of that level. Um, with regard to clause 11 chair the change there is just a correction of a cross reference um and then with regard to clause 16 the, the changes in respect of clause 16 the the bill uh, as it was submitted to the ntop required that the minister must compile a code of conduct in consultation with the with the with the member with the with the cabinet member responsible for traditional affairs um the proposed change there talks to the issue that uh, that have requiring the minister to only make uh, to, to to make the 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 code of conduct in consultation can lead to uh, 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 his uh, powers to making that uh, a code of conduct being hamstrung because the minister will have to obtain the consensus of the uh, member responsible for uh, uh, traditional affairs rather than just to require the minister to consult, uh, that would be would entail consulting in good faith, because the responsibility to compile that code will still remain with the minister. So the the the, the amendment provides for the minister to, or, or the proposed amendment is for the minister to compile a code of conduct after having consulted with the the, the um, uh, cabinet member responsible for traditional affairs, uh, which would then not uh, require that the minister has consensus or obtains cons consensus. Uh, the other amendment uh, talks to the reporting of the of any breach in respect of the code of conduct. The a bill as presented to the NCOP required that the, the the bridge must be reported to the House of Traditional Leaders in the province. Uh, the, the, the bill as initially introduced chair provided that the bridge be reported to the member of the executive council in the province. And this was the recommend the, the, the proposal again in the NCOP. And hence the it has now the proposal is that this provision reverts back to 
uh, what the bill provides for as it was introduced that the breach is reported to the member of the traditional of, of the executive council uh, so that the traditional leaders do not so that there's objectivity and accountability and so that traditional leaders do not end up being judges in their own court against the bridge on one of their own um with regard to clause 18 um clause the the the, the bill um as submitted to the NCOP did not contain the 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 repeal or, or, or the yeah the repeal of sections 12 and 20 of the repealed black administration act because that repeal is provided for elsewhere but because of the need to provide legal certainty so that one does not go and look for that repeal elsewhere but finds it in the bill it was then uh, uh, proposed that the bill specifically uh, repeals uh, sections 12 and 20 of the repealed black administration act which deals with the judicial function of traditional leaders the last a uh, proposed amendment is with regard to the short title chair, uh, the one that talks to the deletion or, or the substitution of 2019 for uh, uh, 2020 in the short title. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. You were right on time. Right on time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation um, and the background presentation. Thank you very much. I will now uh, open for questions and comments from members. I have Honorable Horn, Honorable Glennis Breitenbach, Honorable Nevo Drachan, Honorable Noma Temba, Maseko Jele, Honorable Lumbuisen in Lose, in that order. Honorable Horn. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good morning um, to colleagues and the department. Uh, Chair, uh, my input is really regarding the the way forward and the the, the duty of, of, of this committee now. The, the uh, Deputy Minister in his introduction referred to the fact that this bill was passed by the previous parliament and, and then went was reintroduced in the NCOP and now uh, the way I understand process, we ultimately are faced with a situation that we can either decide to adopt the uh, proposals, proposed amendments made by the NCOP, or if we reject it, then the bill doesn't pass. Uh, and in dealing with that fairly simple task in terms of process, I, however, want to say that it is not as simple and uh, as as only dealing with this the, that matter for for the following reason, and that is that the the previous parliament, uh, based on a report of the previous portfolio committee, adopted the the then draft bill in the face of clear advice by Parliament's legal services that the then bill didn't pass constitutional muster. Uh, so the fact is that uh, uh, the initial bill included uh, what was common refer commonly referred to as an opt-out clause, which would have enabled anyone against whom a process was initiated to indicate that they would rather want uh, the courts well, I want to say other courts, the, the courts that 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 is has been there before the formalization of the traditional courts to deal with the dispute. And and then it was contemplated uh, or initiated an idea to remove the opt-out clause. And uh, because of reservations that that might impact on the constitutionality of, of the bill, uh, legal advice was sought by Parliament's legal advisors, and it was formally introduced to the effect that to remove the opt-out clause would render the bill unconstitutional in nature. And unfortunately, then the majority of the committee decided to to 
to still remove the opt-out clause um, in the face of the, the legal advice. Um, and the then chairperson, just uh, if, I, if I can paraphrase his, his uh, response to the legal advice was that while we respect lawyers and legal advice, sometimes we can also say to them, we don't accept your advice. Oh, uh, this is now a, a long explanation of the process in, in that committee. My, my, some, my input, however, is basically this. We cannot turn a blind eye as, as the successor committee of that committee to the fact that there remains the lingering issue of possible uh, uh, a lack of constitutional muster on the part of the bill. I understand our task now is to simply adopt or not, but my strong advice and my proposal is that we again get advice from legal services as to whether uh, they are still of the view that there's no there is a lack of constitutional muster on the part of the bill, uh, whether some of the amendments made by the, the NCOP could have remedied that situation, um, because otherwise we, we run the risk of ultimately just acting as a if we only consider in isolation the amendments proposed by the NCOP, we run the risk of, of ultimately turning a blind eye to an issue which we should be aware of that, that remains there on the part of the bill. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Honorable Dennis Breitenbach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm largely covered by the input of, of Mr. Horn and I support his suggestion. Um, there remains the problem of unconstitutionality, and I'm sure that the members of this committee do not wish to just rubber stamp a bill that may well be lacking in constitutionality. Uh, and so I would strongly urge us to, uh, to revisit that issue before we make a final decision on this matter. Uh, and then I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Ross, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, Mr. Ross is really so well prepared as always um on slide nine uh, there's a sentence says uh, there seems to be consensus uh, regarding the exclusion of legal representation what, what does that mean there seems to be consensus is there consensus isn't there consensus whose consensus is it uh, i'm a little concerned by that and then with regards to legal representation I understand that legal, represent legal representation is precluded, but you can ask your neighbor or your friend or a colleague to represent you. What will be the position if that neighbor or friend or colleague is in fact a lawyer? Are they then excluded? So if you could just answer me on those points. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Can I ask IT to spotlight me, please? I've received complaints that I'm not spotlighted. <coughs> Great, thank you, IT. Um, oh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ross, for the presentation. I have a couple of um, questions. For a moment, the system kicked me out, and when I came back, you were discussing the disputes. I would like to know what kind of disputes um, is it any disputes for the traditional courts? Um, what kind of disputes uh, will be heard by the traditional courts? And then I would like to know, this bill has been through public hearings, I'm assuming. I'm new in this committee, so I'm not sure if it has gone through public hearings. And then fourthly, uh, if in the normal courts, in our courts that we have, a person is not satisfied with the ruling can that same case be transferred to a traditional court, um, if that's possible? Thank you, Chair. That's all. Thank you very much, Dr. Tangiose. Thanks, Chairperson. Um, well, look, I mean, the problem of process here, I think it's the, it's the very first point of departure before at least we waste our time we have to be clarified because the bill was uh, passed through the National Assembly 
And uh, as the EFF, for an example, we made our position uh, clear then that we were opposed uh, for several issues, including amongst many, the failure for it to align with the constitution. We don't envisage uh, that there could be, um, that these problems are resolved even in its current form as presented uh, here in the meeting. What are we doing? Well, I, I, that, that is, I think, Chairperson, for your guidance, you need to, to help us. What exactly are we doing here? Um, is this process being restarted? Are these amendments going to be consulted with the public? Or it's just now the conversation of only elites like parliamentarians, uh, because the amendments should have been conversed with the public. Uh, I'm, I'm, so I think we need some clarity uh, about the process uh, because I've got a lot of, of comments, I've written them down here about what has been presented, but it, I actually remember that some of these fundamental matters we've already conversed and conversed them at the, at the level of the National Assembly when the bill was debated. Uh, so I think maybe you must, I would request that with immediate effect, we be given clarity in relation to the question of, uh, of the process. What exactly are we being asked to do here uh, so that we, we, we do exactly that? Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ndlozi. The process, the way I understand it, uh, I think, uh, TM can uh, further clarify because uh, he was uh, at some point uh, the member of the Justice Committee. When this matter first came before the Assembly, is that when the National Assembly has dealt with the bill, the bill is referred to the National Council of Provinces for concurrence. If it is a Section 79 uh, bill, if the NCOP makes amendments, the NA, the National Assembly, has got that to reject those uh, uh, amendments and then the process ends there. But if the N Section 76 bill to the National Council of Provinces and the National Council of Provinces makes amendments, the NA, can either reject or accept those uh, amendments if it rejects those amendments. The, the process in terms of the rules is that um, then a mediation committee must be established uh, to ensure that the, these matters that are in dispute are mediated upon. If the mediation process fails, then it lapses. So we are dealing with a, with a process that is prescribed for in our rules. Um, and because now we have, we have amendments that have been done by the NCOP. They must come back to the National Assembly. Then the, if the National Assembly has those amendments, then they are passed, it's fine. Then they, are, they will be sent to president for accent. But if the National Assembly still does not agree with the amendments made by the NCOP, then a mediation committee will be established to mediate. And then if still there is no agreement, then the bill will lapse. So that is how the process is regulated. And that this is what is guiding us for now. But I think uh, if, um, if uh, people who were there before like uh, uh, TMJJ, not in his capacity as a minister, as a minister now, but uh, he has been in parliament for a very long time. Um, if I'm wrong, he can uh, he can uh, he can correct me or further explain the process. Honourable John Jeffrey, uh, Chair, I'll, I'll just respond on that point, hope, and then come back uh, if there are further questions uh, just before Ms. Ross. But you're correct. Uh, it's the procedure outlined in Section 76 of the Constitution that is being followed. Uh, so I think um, 
members should read that, that section. This is a, a bill to be dealt with in terms of section 76 because it affects uh, provincial competencies. Uh, the bill was, and, and just to recap, uh, the bill was advertised for public comment in the National Council of Provinces. Uh, so there have been uh, public comments on the on the bill, but you are you are correct. It's the 76 procedures. Uh, Chair, I see you've still got some hands. If I can come back then on on responding to other issues uh, later. Thank you very much. Um, um... Uh, let me note the following hands, Honorable Breitenbach, Honorable Nipot, Honorable Nomatemba Jaila, Honorable Ndrozo. In that order. Sorry, Mr. Chair, mine was an old hand. I've just taken it down. Okay, thank you very much. Honorable Nipot, Rachan. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to understand the process as you explained it now. I just wanted one more. If the bill lapses, then what does that mean in this process that we are following? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Masoma Sego Jale. Thank you. Sorry, Honorable Nivot, I see your picture uh, here. No, Chair, my, my video is off. Yeah, we, we just saw your picture. We're not sure whether you were singing or what. Chairperson, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Honorable uh, Can you hear me, Chair? Can you yes, hear me? We can, yes, we can hear you. But okay. your bandwidth is low. Can you switch off your video? Okay. I don't know what's happening because even my hand just removed itself. I'm not sure. Maybe there's something wrong with it. But you'll tell me, Chair, if you don't hear me whilst I'm talking because it's like there's a serious problem on that area. Uh, Chair, I think um, uh, I'm glad that you have um, uh, covered uh, at hand. Uh, there are quite some, I'm not sure if maybe one will be outside the parameters of what we need to say today because of the procedure that you have already given us. But I'll, anyway, I will just say whatever maybe questions and clarities that I wanted to ask uh, from, from the, the presenter or Ms. Ross. Um, these bills, Chairperson, to me, we, we don't, we need to make sure uh, that, uh, yes, we are responding also to the constitution, but also we must check Chairperson, uh, when we come, when we we, we 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 come up with these bills, in terms of making sure that uh, we look at the rights of these, uh, uh, for example, the of us, they they they. Meanwhile, we are responding to the constitution. We must also check if maybe. Uh, the ideas that we come with, they are addressing the issue of uh, inequality uh, in terms of these bills, because this is a, a serious and difficult matter, Chairperson. The fact that uh, the presenter is still referring to the Act of 1963, to me, the Act of 1963 was happened in the previous dispensation where chairperson, uh, I don't think that anybody during that time who was uh, 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 coming up with these acts was having uh, uh, at, at that much. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm going to open wounds, but I want to see, ask the chairperson, 
that we are talking in terms of differences between these the two types of courts. Is that not an inequality? In the very same bill, bring synergy in terms of making sure that these courts, they are really indeed being uh, recognized in a manner that even the infrastructure itself, it has to change. Even the, 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 the recognition of our leaders are being skilled to the level of the very same judges and lawyers that we have today. Because if we are going to Honorable Jale, we can't hear you. Uh, pass you these bills hear. with the you same can. status quo of uh, not empowering our leaders to be at the level of recognized on our chair. You can't hear me, Chairperson. We are struggling, we are cutting. Honorable Jare, can we come back to you later? Maybe you need to change your device. Can we come back to you later? Chair. Yes, can we come? Can you come back to you later, please? Maybe you must change the device. Work is really bad, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson. Honorable Jale. Yes, you can do that, Chair. You yes, still don't hear me. Chairperson. Yeah, you're better now. I'm better. Okay. Yeah. Let me sit here, Chair. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if maybe how far, Chairperson, have you heard me? But. You are saying that the, uh, the, the traditional leaders need to be upscaled to be at the same level as all other lawyers. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Because my issue, my question was going to be uh, the difference between these courts, how they are treated when it comes to infrastructure and payment, if there is a difference, why, Chairperson? And also why do we have to pass a bill where it still has not addressed these issues? One. Secondly, Chair, I just want to find out because uh, our, our presenter also, uh, in, uh, in fact, from the presentation, there is, there's, there is issue, the issue of code of conduct. The issue of co this code of conduct, conduct it, 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 to me, it says there is, there, there's going to be an expectation uh, from, from us for our leaders to behave in a certain manner. Why code of conduct? if we don't recognize them the same as, uh, the same as other uh, courts and uh, 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 the people that are players within those courts. So, because now we've got uh, this thing, the term which says the normal courts, you know, there are normal courts that, why do we say we have normal courts and we have traditional courts because that is going to cause us pro pro problems even going forward, forward Chairperson. So I wanted the presenter to help me uh, to, to address and say something in line with it uh, before we come to the issue of saying we agree with this because we need to make sure that all these inequalities because we are addressing the issue of the constitution. If we are addressing the issue of the constitution, that says, Chairperson, we need also to make sure that we equalize everything. There will be no time where we'll have an opportunity to make sure that uh, our leaders who are role players within these tra tra traditional courts, they, they, they are also recognized 
like any other uh, courts. There's a lot of money that is uh, being invested in our courts. Uh, the same way, it should be treated the same way with our traditional courts. So it's, it's my concern, Chair, that I would want to say, meanwhile, we are talking in terms of responding to the constitution. Let's also respond to the rights of those players within the traditional courts. Thank you, Chair, and the infrastructure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Jose. No, Chair, since you have clarified the process we are read, we must uh, be unequivocal then in uh, rejection of, of the amendments and, uh, and reiterate our position that we made clear at the National Assembly that this bill is, remains unconstitutional and it is seriously an entrenchment of inequalities uh, and um, an unequal success to quality, to quality justice. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know why uh, it, it probably people are trying to hold on to it for superstitious reasons. Uh, but there are other things that remain deeply problematic. Uh, for an example, uh, the, the question of assault, uh, just saying assault, which does not distinguish, for an example, to questions of sexual assault or sexual harassment, uh, they can't be heard without proper litigation in such matters. If you are excluding trained legal personnel from these courts, what kind of justice are you hoping to achieve? What kind of justice are you giving black people? What kind of justice are saying black people deserve? Is it justice that is not rigorous, that does not follow in the scientific mechanisms that all forms of justice at this day and age, in the interest uh, of the very people that are aggrieved, we are supposed to, 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 to embrace, as it were, the entire uh, 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 litigation system, the entire justice system, it must, rep it must be replicated because it can be, you no, know, there's justice for black people, there's justice for people in the rural areas. That's what this bill is doing. That is, that is essentially what it's doing is that there are people in our country who live under a different regime of access to justice and they are definitively black and rural and almost 100% working class. Uh, and then finally, there are the, the claim, this is important to dismiss, like the claim that there's this, that the, the, the initiative to align it with the constitution has been achieved is fundamentally wrong. It's not true. We must not mislead each other. It's not true. So the amendments that have come back from the NCOP are not fundamental and uh, they are not assisting with regards to uh, the big problems that this bill um, actually always had. So we, 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 we really don't, uh, we don't support it at all. And uh, I don't know whether there's still a report going to come, but that won't change our mind. If there is an opportunity to restart this process, to truly make uh, justice equal, uh, so that what happens in proper courts happens in rural courts. That's what must happen. Justice is justice. There's no traditional and there's no pink or yellow, or white or green justice. There must be one form of justice which aligns to our constitution. So in that regard, we think that uh, these courts, they are also going to perpetuate a lot of crimes against humanity. Imagine there's a clause here that says the court can give advice on ukutwal. You are, in, you, are, you are indirectly saying that Ukutwala is right. How can Ukutwala be right? You are indirectly saying that they can give advice on Ukutwala. If you are excluding the police, that matters that are, uh, uh, um, that are ventilated with the police cannot come to the traditional courts, what may happen, particularly with domestic sexual violence issues, is that people will be encouraged not to go to the police, but to go to these courts. And as a result, 
there's no rigorous litigation process there. There's no process that uh, 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 you know involves properly trained legal experts. It's problematic. It's wrong. I mean, the NC must be ashamed of of having approved this bill in the first place. Uh, because you are treating black people like a different species. Really, I, I think it's a it's 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 a big big injustice and uh, it's inconsistent. And I know not just ourselves, but I, I, I think that uh, it will not see the light of day because as soon as uh, either concurrence happens at the NCOP, it goes to the president's table, it will be challenged in a court of law and it will fall apart because it's unconstitutional. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndlozi. Uh, um, Honorable DM and your team. Uh, thanks, Deputy Minister. Maybe if I can start and and uh, just give some of the broader responses. Uh, the the institution of traditional leadership is recognised in the Constitution, Chapter Twelve. Uh, those traditional leaders are are only in uh, the former Bantu stands, the former homelands, uh, because the apartheid government didn't recognise rights of African people in in the areas outside the Bantu stands. Um, part of traditional leadership was traditional courts, uh, which I think, as, as Ms. Ross had said, have been there uh, since time immemorial. There's also customary law, which our constitution recognizes, uh, which obviously applies to, uh, to people uh, falling under those, those, those traditions. So we don't have a unified system in the, in the country. Uh, the key issue is these traditional courts exist, as, I, as I've said. Um, they exist in terms of that clause of the Black Administration Act uh, remaining. Uh, but probably even without that, because of the Constitution, uh, people could argue that, that there's a right for these courts to exist. The issue then is to regularize these courts to bring them in line with the Constitution. Uh, this is a process that has been going on for 20 years and it really does need to, to reach finality. There's the Law Reform Commission report uh, from the early 2000s, uh, which, which uh, came up with a, with a draft bill. What we did with this bill was engage with stakeholders and I think it was a very inclusive process. Um, engaged with, with um, people from rural areas, people having an interest in traditional courts, uh, civil society, engaged with traditional leaders, uh, put them together, uh, everybody agreeing that there was a need to regularize traditional courts and there was an urgent need for this legislation. We then set up a reference group uh, to work with us. Uh, the traditional leaders were asked to send representatives uh, civil society, we invited people. Uh, some sections of civil society opted not to participate in spite of that invitation and in spite of them saying that this bill was, was needed. And then a few of them opted to try and undermine the, the process for whatever, whatever reason. But the bill that was introduced into the National Assembly, the Bill 17, or sorry, Bill 1, I think, of 2017, is the bill that was approved by the reference group. Um, obviously, in this, these issues, uh, I mean, I had said to the reference group, we want a bill that we're not going to get a bill that everybody is happy with. We want a bill that people can live with. And that's, that's what we got. And that's what we introduced. Uh, that was the bill also that was approved by, by cabinet for introduction. Now, as I think, well, some of you know, some of you have heard uh, in the National Assembly, um, in the previous portfolio committee, the, well, there were two effective major changes made. The one was the removal of the opt-out clause. Um, the other was, was uh, that um, appeals to the magistrate's court were allowed, which hadn't been there before, because the idea was to not have, have the traditional courts subservient to the magistrate's courts, which had happened because of uh, colonialism. Uh, and... Um, but the effect of the bill is that you are not forced to participate uh, in a traditional court. Um, the, the issues of GBV, I mean, Schedule 2 of the bill uh, specifies what, uh, what um, 
uh, what what uh, can be um, uh, uh, can be uh, can be brought. Uh, the idea is not to include uh, gender issues uh, because of problems of patriarchy. Uh, the, the issue of advice on, on um, custody and guardianship, et cetera, is look, in your normal courts, you would go to, uh, you would go to the maintenance court. Uh, the father has no money um, and pleads poverty. He then doesn't have to pay maintenance. Um, one doesn't want maintenance matters to be in a traditional court, but, but um, you, know, you could probably get a better result uh, in terms of the advice where the community know that, okay, this, this young man is not employed, uh, but he does have some livestock and he can make some contributions as far as livestock uh, for the upkeep of that child. Whereas in the, the normal courts, he would just not have to pay anything. Uh, so there are sort of some benefits. Anuku uh, Twala, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is that it is a deadlock breaking mechanism where Lebola negotiations between families fall down. Uh, traditional traditionists have told me it's not inherently wrong in itself. Uh, the problem is that it's then been abused uh, and that is where the problem comes in. But I, I, um, somebody else can maybe speak on, on, uh, on that. Uh, but basically what, what you can bring to a traditional court is limited. Um, there's no provision that you're actually forced to, to participate. And, and so with the arguments of unconstitutionality, um, I, I, I think the, the section, uh, there were further amendments made to the bill, Honorable Horn, after that legal opinion, uh, um, when, when uh, the then chair at the time was no longer the chair. Uh, but now the bill basically and its guiding principles provides for um, uh, re, uh, well, particularly uh, the fact that the, 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 the voluntary nature of, of customary law, um, uh, founding, this is now, uh, what clause is this? Uh, three, uh, uh, three, three C, no, three, three, um, Sorry, now I've lost the section. Anyway, there's provisions there that provide for the voluntary nature of, of customary law. A founding value on which customary law is premised, premised is that its application is accessible to those who voluntarily subject themselves to that set of laws and customs. There's nothing, I mean, what the, the bill is trying to do is to not uh, redo traditional courts, but bring them in line with the constitution. Currently, as far as I understand, people can't be forced to attend traditional courts and that is still the position. There's no provision that forces anyone to attend. You would note uh, that in the case of, of um, uh, what happens if a person doesn't attend, then a justice of the peace must go and visit the party who's not attending. And they have the power to request the traditional court to have the matter transferred to the magistrate's court. So um, uh, effectively that's, that's all that would, would, uh, would happen in terms of the law. Yes, um, things may be different on the ground, but in terms of the law and that, that, that those things that would be different on the ground would still be there in, in spite of the uh, um, whether the opt out that clause is, is there or not. But as I said, you can't be forced to, to attend a traditional court. Uh, so do you then still need an opt out clause? Um, uh, and the, the changes that Honorable Horn spoke about and the ruling from the parliamentary law advisors was before further changes uh, by, the, um, by, the, the, uh, um, by the National Assembly Portfolio Committee. But I think that, that there are people, my understanding is that, that there was, I see Dr. Lewitz um, uh, from the NCOP is, is here from the NCOP staff. Uh, she can maybe speak about the fact that I think there was um, uh, there was uh, um, uh, you know the, the yeah that the, there was um, there were opinions on the constitutionality of the matter. Um, uh, definitely, we do have different systems of law in our country. Uh, we have have uh, Roman Dutch law. We have statutory law. And we have customary law, which which applies to different people, and that is in the constitution. Uh, so, Chair, I, I, I really look. I, I, I think uh, I'd like Ms. Ross to then respond on some of the points. 
I, I mean, maybe the issue of, of well, no, let her, let her respond on, on, on the points, but we've got to bring this thing to finality. Um, we, it's been, the, the President, Mon well, the Constitution came into effect 24 years ago this month. So it's been 24 years of a new constitution and traditional courts uh, existing and not being regularized. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, it, 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 it can't uh, keep on. This process, I think, has been very inclusive, much more inclusive than most legislation. And um, I would hope that the Portfolio Committee would look at the NCOP amendments uh, and um, and and consider them, which is what is required in terms of, of uh, section uh, 76. It doesn't have to be go back to the NCOP. It's now an issue of, of compliance from the National Assembly. I mean, yeah, yeah, agreement from the National Assembly, and if not, then mediation. Uh, thanks, Chair, but maybe Ms. Ross can respond to the specific issues. Ms. Ross. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, on the question of um, a, a consensus on the use of a or, or, or non-use or prohibition of um, use of legal representatives in traditional courts, um, the, 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 the consensus issue is around the effect that the matter whether or not to allow legal representation was very well ventilated in the reference group and there were there were arguments for and against and there was justification just as it existed in the in the report of the law commission um, and because in the, the the consensus issue arises from the fact that in the previous bill the bill that that previous bill made a distinction between civil and criminal matters and the argument was that no you cannot uh, customary law does not distinguish between what is civil and what is criminal. Now, because that has been removed from the bill, the bill deals with disputes and which also talks to the question of which dispute the traditional court may deal with and which are clearly articulated in schedule two uh, to the bill. Then with a motivation as to why legal representation uh, is not suited for uh, the traditional justice system, then there was this uh, understanding, a, a general consensus between, you know, among the participants in the uh, reference group that there is, yes, there may have been that need in the, in the previous bill because it made that a distinction between what is civil and, and, and it gave, even it even gave the traditional court uh, a, a, a jurisdiction or authority to deal with criminal matters. Then in that case, one would say, then you need legal representation here. But because that has been removed, then there was motivation and justification as to why then legal representation is it's, it's now understandable that uh, it may not be used in the traditional court. Whether, a, a further question or, or, or to that, whether a neighbor who is a lawyer uh, can represent a neighbor of his or hers in the traditional courts, yes, uh, that is allowed, the bill allows that. However, that uh, representative will not be working as a legal representative, but as a person, as a neighbor, as a person in whom uh, a, a, a party to the traditional court has confidence and, uh, and know that will take care 
of uh, or, or has their interest at, at heart. Yes, the one may use their legal expertise, which you know one uh, would wonder whether it would work in the traditional court. But what the one will not be there as a lawyer, but simple as a neighbor, just as a person can be represented by a brother, by a, a, a family relation, or, a, or or whoever, or even a friend. Um, the disputes that a traditional court may deal with are provided for in section two to the bill. And uh, I've indicated that they are such as criminal urea, uh, which in my understanding is what is uh, mostly, or, or, or in most cases, the traditional court deals with. And then your assault common where no grievous bodily harm was inflicted. Um, but it points to very uh, uh, limited and less serious matters. If a matter that is brought before the traditional court is not listed, because the, the, the good thing about what the, 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 the matters, this was that a traditional court may deal with, is the clause does not say what a traditional court may not deal with, but it says what it may deal with. So you have assault and then they are tabulated there. If it is not there, then the traditional court may not deal with, a, with that matter. Um, the DM has spoken about the issue of the justice of the peace. Although this act is a 1963 act, the relevance thereof in this in this uh, in this bill is that uh, it will provide for the functions of a justice of the peace. So it is uh, to say, in terms of that act. These are the confines within which a justice of the peace uh, may move when mediating or, 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 or trying to resolve this dispute. Um, I, I'm not aware, Chair, of any proposals that have been made to, 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 to with regard to the amendments to the justice of the peace, although it is a 1963 act, but uh, surely if uh, there's something uh, of the sort we should be able to take, but uh, for purposes of now and this bill is just to say, is what is relevant here is just their function uh, as provided for in the, in the act. Traditional courts, use a different value system to what uh, ordinary courts, uh, I would not say normal, because I would rather say ordinary courts referring to the courts that use a retributive uh, system, whereas traditional courts use a restorative justice system. So. They, they are functioning uh, or, or, or how they do their business uh, will be different, uh, similar to where in, in your ordinary court, you will uh, be fined in court and then you have to pay, you have to pay a fine if there is a, 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 an alternative, then you can go to jail. But in the traditional justice system, because it's restorative and the purpose thereof is to maintain and promote harmony between uh, or among members of the community. That is why it functions the way it does. Because also, like the DM indicated, the bill does not aim to establish traditional courts. Uh, but rather, the bill aims to align the functioning of traditional courts to to, to the constitution. And this, what I'm saying, ties in with the, 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 the issue of the resourcing because the, the courts, the traditional courts, uh, like they have been operating. And the, the, 
you know, with or without the bill uh, or functioning in terms of sections 12 and 20 of the Black Administration Act, which is, you know, cannot be, be, be good considering uh, that we are in a new democratic dispensation and considering that, that section, those sections made that distinction between uh, between a, a criminal and civil jurisdiction. And hence it makes this, uh, the, 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 this bill uh, uh, important in order to keep this situation because their complaints or, or rather concerns have been made with regard to the abuses that happen in the, in the traditional courts. And aligning them with the constitution will then assist this uh, persons who go to traditional courts or who are because they subscribe to customary law and they are used to, to the system even where even in the case of murder instead of the one uh, going to the police the one would rather go to the traditional leader because the traditional leader will then either call the police or do that because there is no way even in the in the uh, as well, Black Administration Act, there was no way the, the traditional court could deal with murder. But the people would still uh, uh, go to the traditional leader with a case of murder, with a, with a case of rape, which should, uh, which should not be the case. But because they subscribe to the system and they have confidence in the system, you know, with regard to how it works for them. Now, uh, what I'm, I'm saying is that it's people like that who need protection who need uh, yes who needs to be to be protected as especially in the wake of uh, 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 allegations of abuse that have been raised as being prevalent in the system the the traditional whether the the, the, the court whether the traditional court uh, having powers to give advice because it may not deal with Ukutwala. Uh, like the DM has already indicated, uh, it is understood that Ukutwala uh, can be purely criminal in some instances, but already there has been that, uh, the court has already used, uh, taking that step of obtaining uh, advice from the customary law experts or even from traditional leaders with regard to Ukutwala. That case happened in the Western Cape. It was in, in the end, uh, that accused person was convicted of, uh, of, of uh, the offense that he was charged with after advice having been obtained in what Ukutwala entails. And it became clear to the court that uh, this person flouted every rule of Ukutwala. And hence, it is uh, the, the bill provides that the, 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 the traditional court can give advice on what the understanding of that particular, of a particular customary practice is. Um, um, Mr. Ms. Ross, you have two minutes. So, thank you. Um, oh, and, and also, Chair, thank you, Chair. Also, the, the, the issue of um, not providing or not, not uh, allowing legal representation in traditional courts is because, because these courts are accessible to the people that are near to them. They don't need to, to, to take the, 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 the bus and go to the magistrate court in the, in the next town or, and that they are they are, they are cheap, they are, you know, cost effective, and they are mostly, uh, mostly because although the bill currently provides, uh, uh, makes a, 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 in terms of the bill, this bill, a traditional court can sit like anywhere, like for, it, it can sit anywhere. It is not necessarily confined to a, to, 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 to a, a, a rural area. And because even in an urban city where there are people coming from uh, the same, uh, maybe a jurisdiction of a particular traditional leader, uh, those people 
or, or, or the traditional leader can have a person designated who looks to the interest of those people from his community. And in that case, it can sit um, any way. Um, yeah, thank you, Shay. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, there is a DM, there is a question by Honorable Mibot Drachan about what does it mean when you say the bill has lapsed? Uh, Chair, that would mean that's that's the end of the bill. So um, if the, I mean, the, the, um, the issue before this house is, is to, to approve the NCOP amendments. Uh, if they're not approved, uh, then the bill will have to be go to mediation. Uh, and then my understanding is if the mediation committee can't agree, then the bill will lapse, and that means there's no more bill. I and the traditional right. courts continue uh, as they were before. I hope, uh, thank you very much, Tim. I hope uh, uh, Honorable Nivot Trahan uh, uh, is answered. Mm -hmm. uh, I Jefferson, it's, it's Miss Gamer from Legal Services. With your permission, may I come in? Okay. Thank you so much, Jefferson. Um, I must apologize. I joined the meeting when it was already underway because I was with the Portfolio Committee on COCTA for another task, which now I'm, I'm the advisor that is allocated to this bill and is the advisor that dealt with the legal opinion on the constitutionality of the opt-in and opt-out principle. Hence, I'm asking with your permission if I may come in and address maybe just a few of the issues that have been raised, um, which already the colleagues from the department have covered most, but I will just add on what they have indicated with your permission. Proceed. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Uh, greetings to the members and everybody in the meeting. Like I indicated, the name is Pumele Nengema from Legal Services. Chairperson, I just want us to start with the issue of the process. All I want to do there, because I'm not in contra contradicting what you have already indicated and in explaining the processes that Deputy Minister also added. I just want to add that in terms of the processes, we are now dealing with National Assembly Rule 3, 311, which basically tells us what to do once the National Council of Provinces has dealt with the bill, which is a section 76 bill, and has proposed amendments in that bill, which is why today the traditional courts is now in a, a version that is traditional courts 1D version of 2017 instead of the B version that was done by the Portfolio Committee of the National Assembly. And I think what is crucial to add that comes out of that rule is, is the fact that once the matter has been referred to the committee by the speaker after the house has received it from the National Council of Provinces, in terms of National Assembly Rule 311-2B, it says the committee to which the council's amended bill is referred may not propose any further amendments to the bill. And, and, and that, in this instance will then, if the committee wishes to make any amendments or wishes to, to say anything that is not in approval of the bill with the amendment from the National Council of Provinces, it will mean that we then move to the process as outlined in section 76, the mediation process, where both committees will have to then find one another and speak to the issues that they are not in agreement with. That is in respect of the process and I, I, I shall end it there, Chairperson. In respect of the issue that makes the bill constitutional or unconstitutional, the first principle I want to proffer is the principle, is the legal principle that says, when we're looking at a legal instrument, especially legislation, including draft legislation, which is the bills before the committee right now, we must never look at the content and the provisions of the bill in isolation. We need to consider them in total with everything that is being said. In the bill that was introduced before the National Assembly, before the Portfolio Committee dealt with it in the previous parliament, 
the issue of opt-in and opt-out was explicit in the bill. It was expressed, it was clearly indicated. But after the due deliberations and all considerations by the portfolio committee of the previous parliament, those provisions which were expressive as already indicated, whether a person can opt in or opt out in traditional court system were taken out, but not in total. And the amendments that were presented, they still, as the DM has, has already pointed out and Ms. Ross, they still maintain the fact that it is a voluntary situation. It is a voluntary issue in line with section 30 and 31 of the constitution. Now, having said that, Chairperson, the bill clarifies the type that this court is. It is a court, a court of law, which comes out of clause six. It is a court of law that, however, functions as a mechanism to dispute, to, to, to resolve dispute in terms of section 34. It is not a court of law in terms of chapter eight, because the issue there, if we had to place them there, would be the differences they have in terms of the appointments. The appointment system, as we all know them, as especially this committee, of appointing judicial officers in terms of chapter eight courts is different and is, 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 is very much outlined in legislation as to what needs to happen. But specifically for traditional courts, they are not appointed in line with the legislative terms that are set out there, but it is, it is through the customary system. And that is why the bill is very clear throughout its provisions, indicating that this is a system according to customary law. As, as, as people that are practicing customary law as they know it. So the clear point that we need to take out is to be clear that they are recognized as courts of law, but as section 34. And the important provision, which still maintains that this bill before the committee today is constitutional. According to schedule six, item 16, one and six, the constitution says there, every court, including courts of traditional leaders, existing when the new constitution took effect, continues to function and to exercise jurisdiction in terms of the legislation applicable to it. And anyone holding office as a judicial officer continues to hold office in terms of the legislation applicable to that office, subject to any amendment or repeal of that legislation and consistency with the constitution. As I've said, officers that are working in the traditional courts are not judicial officers. And the bill is very clear on that. Furthermore, and the deputy minister did touch on this, is item six. Item six, the deputy minister said it has already been 24 years since the new constitution came into effect. And the final constitution, that is the constitution dictating whether any work we do, any legislative proposal, is it constitutional or unconstitutional, has, in place, has been in place for 24 years already. Item six of schedule 16 says, as soon as practically after the new constitution took effect, all courts, including their structure, composition, functioning and jurisdiction, and all relevant legislation must be rationalized with a view to establishing a judicial system suited for the requirements of the constitution. Now we go back with that in mind, we go back to the provisions of the, of, of the bill. And I said, we must not read the provisions in isolation. I want the committee to specifically go and look at clause 232, D and E. Clause 32D says that in the application of this act, which will be the tra traditional courts bill once it's assented to, passed by parliament and proclaimed as legislation, the following should be recognized and taken into account. 2D, the principles applied in the resolution of disputes in terms of customary law in terms of this act are not in all is same as those applied or understood in the other courts in the judicial system. And that is why I said 
in terms of the express provisions of this bill, traditional courts will be section 34 dispute resolution mechanism, but they are called traditional courts, but they will not be courts in terms of chapter eight or 199 uh, sub E that was mentioned in the constitutional judgment court judgment that indicated that traditional courts when the certification process was done could be courts of law in terms of chapter eight. So this bill is very clear now and it's bringing the certainty so that we will know what type of structure these traditional courts are. Sorry, Chairperson. Furthermore, in terms of the issue of the opt-in and opt-out, it is very clear when we read E, clause 3 to E, which reads as follows. A founding value on which customary law is premised is that its application is accessible to those who voluntarily subject themselves to that set of laws and customs. And that for me is a clear expression to speak to the issue of voluntariness as already been alluded by the colleagues that spoke before me. Hence, my position is to indicate that the bill that was introduced before parliament, before the process is started, was expressly saying there is an opt-in. But the bill that is now, having gone through both houses of parliament, the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces, even though it is not explicit in saying that this structure and these processes of customary law are to be done on a voluntary nature. Uh, person, as a citizen, you choose to indicate that you uh, will sorry, be following chair. the systems of customary law. So, Chairperson, if you read that provision as a well as clause 12. Ms. Ngema, just a bit as a point of order. Uh, what's a point of order? Yes, Chairperson, uh, I think uh, uh, with the greatest uh, respect, these matters have already been said. I think she's repeating. We've heard them from the deputy minister, from uh, the lady that did the presentation. I, I, I think we were circumcirculating at this point. Uh, when the point of departure was, we should have limited ourselves in the first place to what the NCOP amendments were about. So please, with the... We, we don't have uh, to repeat everything. We, we also have to be sensitive to time because the speaker on the platform now is literally taking us through the same points that have been ventilated. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Jose. Um, I think uh, Ms. Ngema is responding to the issue that was raised by Honorable Horn of the constitutionality of the bill. But uh, Ms. Ngema, please uh, just talk to areas that have not been ventilated. Thank you, and Bear in mind that uh, at the end of the day, we, we as the committee, uh, since we are the sixth administration, we will ask for a formal legal opinion to be written to us because now we we do follow what you are saying, but we will still need you or the parliamentary legal services to give us a, le a formal legal opinion uh, that we can look at and apply our mind to it. Thank so you, Chairperson. Can you cover areas that have not yet been ventilated? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I, was, I, was, I was also just about to round off on two issues that um, align with what I, I've already said and what has been said. So Chairperson, those two, and it was in response also to the two questions that I feel were posed to us and we should answer them. Um, the first one, like I said, is, is in terms of giving a view whether the bill as it stands is constitutional or not. I've pointed that out, and as you indicate, we will have to put that in writing. The second issue, Chairperson, is the issue of legal representation, which also still aligns to the issue that this bill and the legislation drafted is to align with the customary law as it stands. And as my colleagues pointed out already, and what we see in Clause 7.4a, it was pointed out that any person can assist 
but you will not be coming there on a basis of a legal representation as a legal representative as we know them. Secondly, the issue of the right to legal representation in criminal proceedings arise from section 35, 1F of the constitution. And it is very clear there as to what the circumstances that a person has a right to legal representation. I should end there, Chairperson, and trust that um, it is clear, at least we've tried to answer the questions for the members to be able to be decisively enabled moving forward as to what to do and what decision to take. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Ms. Ngema, for your assistance. Um, there are still hands here. I'm not sure whether uh, it's, they want to come back or they did not know. Please, yeah. um, I must uh, caution members that this is a briefing. We are still going to deliberate as the committee. And um, we, uh, we should not create an impression that we are deliberating. We are, we are receiving a briefing from the department uh, of which we are still going to deliberate um, and ventilate all of these matters. Ms. Taylor. Okay, Chair, I think uh, you, you just covered me because uh, when you are saying we are still going to have an opportunity yeah. to deliver on this, uh, uh, taking into consideration that uh, this bill is coming from the sixth, uh, the fifth parliament, which is we are not uh, negating the work, the good work that has been done by our colleagues. And we are not saying we don't want this bill. I think uh, our, our officials, our department must understand that we are not saying we don't want it, but we are saying, let it reflect exactly what we want to see our African community being accommodated in this dispensation uh, where we're talking democracy. Much as we understand, we are not saying they are experts on these areas of law. They are correct to tell us that this bill is constitutional and it aligns with whatever and whatever. They are the best people to tell us that. But also, they must also consider the issue of saying, we are here for that very community that also have been yearning for civilization, but civilization should talk to their needs and it should come from them as to how do they want they them to be improved. In closer, Mr. Chair, Chairperson, uh, just without wasting your time, Chair, just a little bit, uh, let me just say, I hear the, 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 the DM saying, uh, we must bring this thing to finality. I want to caution, Chair, Chairperson, that this thing is very important to the African community. We should not force it to come to finality when the, the people who are going to uh, be involved in this thing or this traditional big using it, feel that there must be some gaps that needs to be closed. Uh, I think uh, I'll stop there, Chair. Other views, I will come with them later because the very issue of Ogutwala, we still have to, it's criminal, it's kidnapping. There's nothing good about Ogutwala. It's, 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 we have to understand it from that point of view. So that is why we don't understand if are, they are saying issues of criminality, uh, they cannot be dealt with. Let the, 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 the leaders tell us that kidnapping, for example, is not criminal. Then we will come and agree and say, okay, they said that it's not criminal. They are fine with it, but is everybody fine with it? Chairperson, in, I'm closing this matter the issue of opting out and opting in. That issue is going to make Africans to stay at the level where they are. So it means we are saying in this, uh, with this, this, this discussion, Africans must stay where they are. Let's continue with what was happening with in terms of how the laws were. In fact, the very same traditional bill is supposed to be the one that is informing the, uh, the, the very Roman Dash law and all those things uh, in, in making sure that it is the one that is leading. We are in Africa, we are not anywhere. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I must say to members still, 
we are still going to deliberate uh, on this bill. Bear that in mind. Honorable Hon. Yes, thank you, Chair. Minus not to deliberate. Um, I want to firstly thank you for your uh, uh, guidance from the chair in indicating that we must obtain a fresh legal opinion. And in that regard, I just want to request that the parliamentary legal services also take the following without deliberating on the merits. And that is that they're quite correct to say that, that uh, provisions cannot be read in isolation. But similarly, what, what is important for our courts when, when uh, uh, interpreting legislation to a large extent is also uh, the, the uh, purpose or the, the reasoning of us as legislators when, when, the, when we made the laws. And in that regard, it is very explicitly on record that the majority of the previous portfolio committee felt that the, the opt-out clause should be removed in order to not allow for people to uh, defeat the functionality of the traditional court system by opting out. And I want them to consider whether the, uh, and go back to the, to the minutes. Uh, well, I don't think that the previous portfolio committee ever had official minutes, but the PMG minutes and the recordings are available. And consider whether the arguments raised at the stage did not in fact uh, point to a change in the voluntary nature of the, the customary law system. And whether it is then suffice to say that the, the general principle or the founding value of the voluntary nature of this, by, by maintaining this in the act, uh, we still find. So my plea is just that in dealing with the further uh, legal opinion, the, the proper context provided by the deliberations at the time is also specifically taken into account. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, but I think it would also be important to, to deal with the text as it is now, uh, taking into consideration the amendments that have been made uh, by the National Council of Provinces. Um, for us, it's important as the committee, if there is any slight um, view that uh, indicate that there might be some element of, of unconstitutionality that we satisfy ourselves before we proceed or pass anything, that we have done some level of due diligence in ensuring that uh, uh, we took the necessary legal advice to and satisfy ourselves that the bill as it is before us and recommended to the house it is constitutional. That is the basis for us to, and that we, we want to have um, a further a legal opinion that uh, you, you look at this issue. Uh, Ms. Ngema, uh, you can take all of the issues into consideration. We would want at least in the next two weeks uh, that the legal opinion uh, be served before us because we, we are pressed for time. We are dealing with too many issues uh, as the committee. So we don't want to leave things lingering without time frames. So within the next two weeks, can this matter come before us? We will, uh, hey. write, we will write to you uh, to indicate which day will, uh, will we be discussing this matter. I think uh, the committee secretariat, they do have a date on which we will be deliberating on the bill. Honorable members, can we, can we move from this topic to the next topic? Is that agreeable? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, for coming uh, today. And thank you to your team for good preparation um, and the good presentation that we have received. I think we are, we are better empowered, even those of us who were not in the, fifth, in the fifth parliament, we do understand now what the issues were 
um, and I think we are preparing ourselves to 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 deliberate and to contribute to the matter as soon as possible. Uh, thanks, Chair. I will I will stay on until I have to leave because uh, I also want to hear the inputs on the uh, the GBV bills. Um, and I it seems my meeting is now going to be a bit later than than before. But I'll so I'll, I'll still remain in the meeting. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but thank you very much to your team. I know they've got other issues to deal with. They are free to go and focus on other issues. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can we have a five minute break, comfort break? Uh, we will start at 10 to 12. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair.
Uh, can we start? Uh, Dr. Lutz, um, welcome back. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, we have read your presentation, the two documents, the legal opinion and the background uh, document. Um, today, we will allow you time to go through them. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, honorable members. Uh, just to say, seeing it's the first time I'm addressing the committee this year, best wishes for 2021. I hope it's kind to us all. Um, Chair, through you, what I've done with the, um, with the PowerPoint presentation that Sia is um, flighting there is to take the, the crux of, of every part of my opinion and my annexure document and um, zone in on the, ish the pertinent issue that the committee asked in five areas to determine whether something was constitutional or not. So um, the purpose for me attaching the annexure as well was to give the committee an indication of how f the type of research I did in the time that was allowed to, uh, to do that in-depth research. So um, I won't be going through all those details. I'll just uh, deal with it in a what I hope is a crisp and, and clear manner. So um, with permission, Chair, yes, uh, thanks. Yeah, if we can look at the bail issues, uh, the in the... The criminal and related matters amendment bill with the with the CPA, um, so it, it's clause two and three and four in the bill, but it's sections 59, um, 59A and 60 in the CPA. Uh, the issue of um, whether bail should be allowed or denied, specifically with regard to or the types of bail uh, being denied to. Um, to accuse persons of, of domestic violence <clears throat> in these regards, I looked at two specific constitutional provisions, section 12 and section 35, with section 12 being that everybody should be um, should be free and secure in the person and their person, and section 35, the, the due process provision, but, but with specific consideration that nobody should be detained unreasonably and, and, and without, if it's not in the interest of justice. So that was my starting point. And um, for that, I also then looked at case law. For instance, um, the Carmichael judgment started the narrative in the constitutional court that there is a duty on the state to prevent um, crimes uh, being committed by um, persons in custody. So if somebody get, gets out on bail and they commit a crime, that, that needs to um, be prevented. So that's on the one hand. And then state versus Lamini is the constitutional court. Um, I want to say most it's the clearest, it's almost like a, a, a mini dissertation on, on Section 35 rights in the context of bail. And the, the Constitutional Court said that there, there, is, a, there is this Section 35 uh, requirement that you should not be detained unnecessarily, but it also says that a arrested person has a circumscribed right to be released from custody, and that, um, that must be on re unreasonable conditions and if the interests of justice so, um, so allow. So, yes, there is this general idea of a right to bail, but it's not an absolute right. It is... Um, the only thing that, that I, th I think that's quite clear is you can't absolutely deny bail as an option. Um, so we can't say all uh, accused sex offenders, none of them can, uh, can be considered for, for bail in any way or form. That would be unconstitutional. But the Constitution itself gives, the, gives this general idea of a right to bail. Um, but what it does not do is it does not uh, prescribe the specific type of bail. So the constitutional, the constitution and the constitutional court doesn't say that it must be prosecutor bail or police bail or court bail. Um, the court has been quite clear that it with, it it leaves it to the legislature to determine what how the the bail process should be. And in fact, in in um, the Dlamini case, the court acknowledged that within the structure of the CPA, there is a clear legislative intent to curtail bail for suspects in um, very serious crimes. So the court acknowledges that there are serious crime considerations when the legislature is um, determining how the bail process looks in the legislation. 
I think what, what I just want to highlight as well is, although, uh, although it's not an absolute right, bail is in this consideration and it, when the legislature looks at how the, the processes should be outlined, bail is not a formal, it's, it's not as formal a process as a trial, as a trial process. So it's quite unique in that aspect. Um, it's not, it's non-punitive, it's not concerned with whether the accused person is guilty. Um, so that, that comes in the trial phrase. So Phase, but what it does, it, it calls for a compromise between the rights and interests of the accused and their family, because they may be the breadwinner and or, or the only parents to uh, to children. But you also weigh that balance that with the victim in the community. So you can, um, so with the interest of justice, the courts have said that it does not equate fully just to the to the interest of the victim or the community because that's your social interest. But what the court in Lamini did also say is that you can legitimately include a risk that the detainee will endanger a particular individual or um, a public group in your interest of justice consideration. So that's the balance. So in then reaching a conclusion, it it's a it's a value judgment that um, a court does when they consider uh, bail on a case-by-case basis. So with police bail, the, the Constitutional Court in Glamini highlighted that that's more for your, for your lesser crimes. So, uh, so, so I think the, the big discussion comes in from a, a practical perspective between prosecutor bail and court bail. And as I said, there's no constitutional right that anybody has to prosecutor bail. But what I got out of um, the readings is that there it may be that the committee would need to actually ask the, the MPA and the prosecutors, as well as the magistrate courts, what the impact will be in giving effective um, expression to, to the amended provision if um, prosecutor bail is also excluded. But that, that's, com that's completely a logistical thing, um, how to effectively implement it. That's not something that I can comment on as unconstitutional because it isn't. It's for the legislature to decide which one. Uh, it might also just be good to mention that in the event that police bail and prosecutor bail is denied, that section 50 of the... Um, of the CPA actually says that bail must be granted, um, bail not so granted, uh, that person then must be brought before the court as soon as, as reasonably possible, um, no later than 48 hours. And then the, the, the court, the Supreme Court of Appeal in Mashile versus Prinsley actually said that that design of Section 50 with that reasonable, um, that it must be within a reasonable time and somebody shouldn't just be locked up and forgotten about, that's the least restrictive um, manner an accused a freedom rights can be limited. So um, I think when it comes to the practical application, it's just a question of if, if prosecutor bail is taken out of the out of the equation, what the impact will be on the magistrate's court's um, capacity to deal with with things in that reasonable opportunity, possible time. Uh, but yeah, yes, I, I can't find in the provisions that it is in the bill regarding to bail, I can't find anything that to me shouts a constitutional or unconstitutionality. Um, it's basically, it's a policy decision for the committee to decide uh, whether they want to just allow court bail in certain instances or would like to incorporate some of the others. Um, Chair, uh, would you like me just uh, as a point of clarity, would you like me to wait for the members to ask uh, questions or respond to each uh, slide or each discussion, or should I finish everything and then and then answer questions? I think you should finish everything because it's only six slides. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And see if we can go on to the parole issue, please. Thank you. Um, the, with, with regard to the consideration of parole, which is uh, primarily um, clause nine of the bill, but it's section two nine nine A in the in the um, in the CBA. Um, it, this was a this was a strange one for me because in following the. The discussions during the public hearings, um, there was a lot of, of discussions of parole and that um, it must have a more victim-centered uh, perspective and, and within, that, within that frame. Um, but looking at section 299A specifically, uh, the wording itself does not really trigger 
a concern that it is not is not victim centered. In fact, I, I read it as being very victim centered. Um, so I approach this by looking at parole just from the various motivations that it has. It requires a balance to be struck between uh, preventing recidivism, uh, to promoting social integration, and to pre protecting the victims in society. So that all, all those considerations mixed in is found in section 299A, but also in terms of um, the other legislative provisions and the um, Correctional Services Act also has provisions of parole. So, so this, this specific section is not the is not the complete sum of what parole is. Um, in that said, in the constitution, in section two nine nine a, it recognises legislatively a right for the victims to have to make representation. What it doesn't do is it doesn't give an um, a prisoner a right to parole. So there's no rights contrast here where I could say, but there's a potential for a or blatant infringement on a right of an offender. Um, what it does do, and this the um, that the courts have have. It's shown as it does give this parole idea a balance in the evaluation that the victim centered perspective will not be undermined in the manner that 299 is um, drafted. And I actually think it, it speaks more to a victim centered approach in that it is including considerations in relation to the Domestic Violence Act. Um, I could find nothing in um, that provision that, that shouted un unconstitutionality. Um, perhaps just as a note, and I, I don't know if I know enough about the parole provision, so um, my DOJ colleagues can, can tell me if I'm completely missing the boat or misunderstanding something. I did find in a few court cases that that final that, that final qualification of the the right of a victim to make representation in 299 it ends with if he or she is present that he or she has a right um, to make such representations uh, so present in the court case some of the some of the courts have read that very narrowly the word present others have read it very broadly so I just picked up an interpretation um, difference as to that may limit the, the right of um, the victim in that regard, but that to me is more an interpretation thing than it is a constitutionality thing. Um, so yeah, if we can go on to the next one, please. Uh, with the plenary legislative power um, concerns, that relates to the definition of a person who is vulnerable and the committee's request that we look at a way whether it is possible for um, some tasks to be given to the department and the minister to help inform that definition of vulnerable person. This is a, I know that um, my, my colleagues, colleague Dr. Buta explained to the committee that this is, this is a very dangerous area. And I, I am inclined to agree. You must, when it comes to parliament delegating a function, uh, it, it requires a very cautionary approach. Um, I discussed this this uh, specific provision with our, our um, senior of drafting as well. And she explained to me that this consideration was also discussed during the, the Credit um, Act and when they worked on that. So there is a there's a very small line that one can walk uh, that allows for a legislative function to be uh, delegated without uh, without de um, delegating the plenary power. Uh, see if we could just go back to the. And that's slide four, please. Thank you. So in Doctors for Life, the Constitutional Court said that the legislator must carry out its functions without interference. So nothing that is drafted with regard to the involvement of the department in determining when a when somebody qualifies as a vulnerable person um, should lead to interference in the function of parliament. Um, the parliament is not allowed to surrender or transfer uh, what the court, a constitutional court, it's called its omnipotence, uh, which I kind of like. Um, the legislature also in Darwood, they say, does not have an unfettered power to delegate. And in the Shuttleworth judgment, it said that there must be a delicate balance between the substantive and the procedural limits. So in looking at whether a provision like, um, is unconstitutional in that it gives too much plenary power away, one must not look just look at the how it's worded, but also the what. Um, so 
an injustice alliance and in here's where the very, very small line that we're walking comes in. The Constitutional Court has in, in cases and, and the Supreme Court and others considering these issues indicated that they may, uh, you may not ordinarily delegate um, the essential legislative functions, but there is cases that recognize that for effectiveness and flexibility and also because Parliament and its committees does not always know the policy considerations that inform something, that there could be circumstances where that information would be required for inclusion of, of that sub four that allows for the um, to be um, on the DOJ's website. That itself takes South Africa out of what it current, its current understanding framework and approach is to, um, to the register. And it moves us almost in line with the United States idea of um, public viewing access and notification. So in looking at this, I first looked at some comparative analysis with the United States having their registers open. Um, I picked up that they don't distinguish between adults and children, which is something South Africa can't do because we have the judgment from the constitutional court saying the best interest of the child and you can't include the names of child sex offenders. So that already we, we are distinguishable in our law from um, the US system. The US one gives unrestricted access and um, there has been indications that this is, has resulted in harassment and ostracism and even violence um, because there, there is little evidence to prove that when you have the US sex offenders register public, fully public approach, uh, that it actually protects anyone. Yes, you have the notifications that can, um, can come out and every state uh, can decide for themselves how their notifications are of a risk of a sex offender being in the area is to be dealt with. But it is, it is very open to being abused. So that, that is the one far side. And then we have the UK that's kind of like hovering somewhere in the middle between South Africa's system currently and the United States. And the UK allows for that parents can request uh, the criminal status of, of a suspicious individual that have frequent and unsupervised contact with, with their child. Um, they can request the police for information on that. The police will then investigate and they'll report back to the parents and inform them. But they will do so confidentially. So this is not an open, a completely open system like the United States. There is that element of confidentiality that links up to, uh, to our, our system in a way. Um, and it is more structured than the U.S. There was an instance of a uh, of a uh, tabloid wanting to publish all the names of pedophiles that they could trace on their website, and um, that was completely shut down in the United States. And they went, "No, that's too much of an infringement. We can't do that, but we we can manage this this system." So UK has Sarah's law approach, and that's that one. And then the US has the Megan's law open completely one. And South Africa's one currently is limited to employment in a specific context, in a very, very, um, very defined context. And it also has the confidentiality requirement. So an employer getting information about a um, a potential sex offender can't just go publish it somewhere. Uh, it has it's, it's very strictly controlled and it is confidential. So that's the starting point. And now with the proposal that we almost go the, the United States way of having it open, uh, we may not have as much information available as the United States would, but uh, that will, the impact of that is still, even if it's just the name of a person that's published, that itself carries a risk. So I went to go look at... Section at the proposed section 424, uh, at and I measured it against dignity. And the stigmatization that comes with somebody's name being publicly available for anybody to see and report on as they see, see fit carries almost a sense of a lifelong um, punishment and humiliation and harassment. Yes, there is a provision that in certain circumstances a name can be removed from, um, from the list then if public, but in the reality of the world we live in, when something is on the internet, even if you try and take it away, it's on the internet somewhere. Um, so there is that risk of a lifelong punishment that infringes on the dignity of the person with the stigma, stigma attached to it and always attached to it. 
Then looking at the equality aspect, if we look at what the what, what the impact will be is with gender-based violence cases or, or offenses, it's not always just it, it won't necessarily always fall in the sex offender's character. It can be a, a or category. It can be a violent crime. So if you publish the the sex offenders register and you look at it from a gender-based violence perspective, there's a differentiation between the sex offenders and the violent um, criminals that could both have committed a crime in a similar like category, but you're only making the names of the sex offenders public. So that's the one differentiation. And the, and the other one that is of real concern to me, especially if we look at the Constitutional Court's position on the best interest of the child, you're going to draw a distinction between the child sex offender and the child of a sex offender. Because if the parent's name is on the list and the child gets identified, that stigma and humiliation and harassment will link to the child. So you have how, that then looks at a concern of the best interest of the child of a sex offender that can't, because it can't be regulated, opening these floodgates. Um, it's so you can't manage that a sex offender won't even be able to manage that sense of privacy. Yes, it's already if you look at the South African system, there's already a limitation on the privacy because a potential employee can get information about a person. But that's very strictly controlled. If you open those those public floodgates, there's no way of the sex offender being able to control his inner sanctum almost of information, his to protect his family and um, to function in that way. So with that, you get like an infringement on equality and privacy. Then also with regard to freedom and security of the person, um, it's almost, um, you're, you're gonna, it, they, people looking at the impact says, you're gonna cultivate a fear of discovery and um, the possibility of community of vigilantism. So with that, then you, you deem the, the impact is the reverse, where you're trying to protect um, the potential victims, uh, you are actually fully like placing that risk on the sex offender and, and his or her family. So you have that idea of a of almost like a, just it's just fear that you send out. Uh, freedom of trade and occupation and profession. Yes, we have a, a limit on the employment as it currently stands within the, within the um, register. But if you make it public, then if somebody, if a sex offender wants to start his own business and he wants to have, like, he, he's trying to set up a way of livelihood to make money for himself, to make money to support his family, all of that, with the person's name being public uh, will limit that employment opportunities that can come his way in circumstances where the person is not dealing directly with, with um, a vulnerable person. So you open that up and then you, you find the risk of demotivating offenders from participating in, in our um, employment system. And that then leads to the increased risk of reoffending. Because if you don't make any money, then the chances of you falling back into a criminal context it becomes like a vicious circle. So the limitation placed on livelihood in a general perspective and not just in a clearly circumscribed one like we currently have is also an infringement risk. That then is, uh, it goes, is opposed by the argument of access to information, that there should be clear access to information, that the public should know, that the um, public has a right to know. But that appeal... Or, or instant appeal that from the public that triggers that access to information argument. Um, the, the courts have commented, uh, academics have commented, and even the South African Law Reform Commission in its report, uh, report 107 has comment, commented that you create a false sense of, of individual and community security, especially if you look at the fact that a lot of the sexual offences is committed by a family member, and that then stays in the family circle and isn't even uh, reported. So you don't have, you don't really have the names of those people in the, the offenders list. So you you create you're basically sending a a disproportionate and um, a not clear not, a not a true reflection of a report to the public because those people can't be traced. 
that is all. Um, my conclusion is that on, on, with regard to constitutionality, I do think there's a concern with making it public. I do think it's challengeable and I do think it's a possibility that such a challenge in the constitutional court will succeed. Because I don't think the goal of the public public register um, is... <laughs> Is it, it or can be equated that that goal and that limitation it can't be balanced out with the, with the cost that you're going to pay with regard to the right to dignity, equality, privacy, freedom of security of person, and freedom of trade, occupation, and profession. That is just such a unbalanced like impact that the the chances that that there are and I think it's a high probability that that it could be found that there should be a less restrictive means of of getting the idea and the goal behind the National Register of Sex Offenders to have an effective impact without um, without almost just letting the offenders pay forever in the infringement of their rights. So that that is my big concern. I think it's a, there's a publication as an unreasonable limitation of constitutional rights. With regard to the issue of retrospectivity that came um, came up during that discussion because Section 42.1 of the um, of the National Register of Sex Offenders does allow for a, for the retrospective inclusion of of names in uh, the registry as it currently reads. And I had a discussion with the DOJ uh, colleagues on that. That limitation on rights that goes with the retrospectivity can be justified. So you have a, gen a general presumption against something being being Retrospectively, retrospectively applied, but um, and you, but there's also the when you can justify the limitation, that can be done. So it's not a complete no. We can never go retrospective. In some instances, if you, if you can justify it, it can. And currently, as it reads, within the limited scope of the register and it being honed in to focus on a specific portion of of the employment and that aspect and keeping sex offenders away from contact contact with vulnerable persons that being so is fine um, but in my discussion with advocate Priya, we looked the, the issue came up of if you have the national sex offenders register public and it's now also retrospective the person who is placed in in the register or was placed didn't have the understanding that that their information would be public. So the legal consequences that would result from the now public register being retrospective is risky. And because the National Register of Sex Offenders carries a bit of punitive character, you're also almost adding to the to the punishments and it's extending it way beyond the scope of what the punishment was intended for when it was when the register was supposed to be retrospective only with regard to certain almost confidential areas. So there's a clear constitutionality concern in broadening the scope of the register because that will also broaden the scope of retrospectivity, which could be open to um, the argument of an unreasonable legislative consequence. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, members. Uh, that is, in a nutshell, what I concluded in time allowed to do the research, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, I really needed that time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lutz, for being able to summarize such a big document into such precise uh, slides that uh, I think has been helpful. I will now note hands from members who would want to make comments, ask questions for clarity. I have uh, Honorable Yuli Swayako, Honorable Bernard Horn, Honorable Glenis Wittenbach, Honorable Velmani Wodrachan, Honorable Nomatemba Maseko Tele, in that order. Uh, um, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, thank you, Dr. Lutz, for this um, information. Um, I'm going to go down through the slides that you showed us. Um, you spoke of Section 35 that talks about a constitutional right um, or a constitutional right for bail or circumstance where bail will then be applied to the sex offender. 
And I'm curious to understand exactly what kind of constitutional right would dictate um, a sex offender to then receive bail. Um, I think we need to have a victim approach um, when it comes to uh, the sexual offenders uh, bill in, in terms of also holding um, the legislation, holding not only the judiciary, but also the police accountable um, for actions or negligence when it comes to persecution of sex offenders. Um, so a delegation of powers needs to go not only to the judiciary, but also to the police as well, because that's mostly the first point of contact. Um, they also need extensive education to understand exactly what vulnerable groups are. Um, I would say that is, is, is very touching to me per se, because um, just like you said, uh, it, 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 who is a vulnerable group? Um, it could be a woman uh, who is 40. It could be a child who is 10 years old. It could be a boy or a girl. It could be a gay or lesbian uh, person. It could be a disabled person. So there needs to be some sort of uh, examples of what we term as vulnerable people. And maybe we need to engage a lot about who are vulnerable people because there are a lot of vulnerable people um, judging by the statistics that we have in this country. Um, I think the National Register definitely must be a priority. And I am not of the opinion that this um, register needs to protect the offender. Um, if you're going to put um, America as one of the countries that you would uh, say that would be an example. America has an open sex offenders register, but that doesn't stop the sex offender from actually having a job. It doesn't stop a sex offender from living their lives. There are many sex offenders in America who are living and thriving. However, we need to strip the rights. So when we go to, to, to for instance, I'll make the case of Oinene, had he been on the sex offenders list that was known publicly, perhaps that would have been a red flag to say we're not putting him where we're putting him but we're placing him somewhere else if we do need to employ him. So I don't think we need to prioritize the rights of the offender, but also the rights of the victim as well. Um, in terms of, of, of children who are sex offenders, I do believe that there needs to be also a separate uh, sex offenders list for children, um, for those under age, that could be then sheltered. However, I believe if they are in a school system, the schools that take them in or absorb them need to understand that this um, underage child is a sex offender. So um, I was just to say that, yes, we cannot give humanity to sex offenders. And if you're going to give an example of America, you need to understand that that works very well. And South Africa does need to have a sex offenders list. There's a variety of people who are operating even in parliament, even in any space who are actual sex offenders. Um, and we need to know who those people are. And there needs to be a register and it needs to be taken quite seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Yako. Honorable Ornohan. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, in respect of, uh, I firstly want to say uh, we are indebted or must express our gratitude to Dr. Lewitz for, I think, largely a, a well-reasoned uh, piece of advice. I just want to um, touch base with her on the, the issue of bail, however, um, and ask whether she has considered the possible impact and whether that should be taken into account of the uh, proliferation over the last years and uh, of cases against the state on the basis of unlawful arrest and the fact that the, uh, let's say, the damages suffered when found by our courts ultimately are then exacerbated uh, in the event that that bail uh, could only be uh, uh, afforded to a, 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 a person in in custody, uh, then if there was an unlawful arrest, obviously the exposure of the state will be much bigger. She has 
alluded to the fact that we should possibly also uh, see guidance from the NPA and the SAPs and possibly these questions will be better addressed to them. But I just wanted to, uh, to hear from her whether that matter has been considered by her in her uh, preparations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Glynis Bretenbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope my dog keeps quiet. He's making a big noise. Um, thank you for a, a very well-reasoned uh, presentation. Uh, I'm largely covered on the issue of bail by, um, by the Honorable Horn. I just wanted to add, um, and I don't for one moment want to make light of gender-based violence. It's a serious issue and we should take it very, very seriously. It is, however, so, and also in my own experience, um, it is so as a prosecutor that it's an allegation that is relatively easily made. Um, and at the stage of arrest, there's not a lot of evidence necessarily. Um, and so you could, you often as a prosecutor have uh, allegations of, of, of violence, domestic violence, rape, that are later withdrawn for a variety of reasons, uh, whether they're good or bad is not relevant to this discussion. Uh, but you know, the end result would have been that somebody would have spent time incarcerated either in a police cell or in prison, um, possibly for not a, a fundamentally good reason. Um, have you factored that into, into your thought train and it's an exceptionally difficult um, piece of subject matter. I accept that. Um, and I have 26 years of prosecuting experience and I don't have all the answers. Um, but it, it is an allegation sometimes easily made, often with no full appreciation of the consequences of, of a baseless sometimes allegation made. And I'm again not suggesting that all of these allegations are baseless, they're not. Uh, but some of them are. And have you any suggestion on how to deal with it, with that problem? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Breitenbach. Uh, Honorable Newport, Jacha. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you to Dr. Lewis for your presentation. I don't have the slide number, but uh, at the top, it speaks about parole. And then at the bottom, it says, note, if he or she is present, then he or she has a right. Now, my question is, if he or she is not present, what happens then? Maybe the victim was not able to come. Maybe they are ill. Maybe they passed on already. What then is considered? Can the victim's family members go uh, or represent them uh, if they are not present? What happens in such a situation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Rachel. Honorable Jale. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm not sure if this because I'm still on off on my thing. But Chairperson, uh, partly I'm I'm covered. The uh, I wanted to comment on the issue of the register, but Honourable Yaku covered me and in terms of the list and all that. Uh, my comment would be just uh, to say, uh, but before that, let me just. Uh, Thank uh, Dr. Liu for a very good presentation. Uh, I think it, when the discussions come, we will be able to <clears throat> take informed decisions out of those ideas that came out of this presentation. But now, I just wanted to on a light note, Chairperson, that will be very interesting. Uh, if we can uh, do a list of <laughs> those sex offenders uh, from the very same parliament that we are talking about, as uh, Honorable Yaku uh, proposed. 
So I think uh, we can start here and clean here if there's any. <laughs> thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Maseko Jele, Honorable Jose. Yes, thanks, Chairperson. <clears throat> no, I, I'm also very, uh, I'm impressed by the the presentation. I must apologize. I didn't read the 90 something page document sent to us. So I also, in a way, would uh, apologize in advance. Uh, I read the, I think the summary version, which mm -hmm. sort of shot straight uh, to the, sorry? You read the legal opinion. Yes, the second, it was mm -hmm. like a, yeah. But there's an, a, a much larger document. I will definitely mm -hmm. find time to like, my head on it. So when you when you do the comparisons, uh, part of what I think it's critical to mark the distinctions of our society vis-a-vis -vis other societies' systems, because when you're comparing at that level, you're comparing solutions. So the American system versus our system uh, with the publication of sex offenders at the register. Um, what would have helped us is the statistical reality of South African society, which, which gives a lot of, uh, I think, um, gravitas to what is it that we have to do uh, to, to, to respond to what is a pandemic, as the document puts it, of GBV. And, and I'm interested specifically here with the idea of the child. Uh, in our law, there is, which we must all agree, this importance to protect children from all sorts of things, but including violence against each other. So when you look at... Uh, child mortality rates in South Africa, you realize if you zoom and the statistics I could get into, uh, I could find um, where I think latest were 2019, I might be wrong. But when you study um, violence that is uh, done on children and the, and the murder that is done on children, the sexual harassment that is done on children, you realize that some of it is done by other children. Um, there are a lot of sex, violent sexual offenders amongst teenagers. Where in a, a lot of these teenagers kill each other, but they are also engaged in sexual harassment uh, within and outside institutions, as well as within the family space, as well as rape. 16-year-olds, uh, 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds. Uh, and I think this is the true trick, which even in your presentation, you didn't come out clearly about what exactly are you saying to us? What is the advice? Uh, what I could work out is, at the Constitutional Court, there is a definite no-no when it comes to children. But have we considered these statistics and the reality that, uh, like what we may call child-on-child -child violence, the significance of, of parents, not just institutions of high learning, uh, that the, the friends of my children that I open my door space to knowing the nature of sexual violence or sexual offense. Uh, uh, if I open or allow my children or, or that parental responsibility, I, I ought, shouldn't I know that so-and-so has been found guilty, uh, whether they're 16 or they are uh, 12, Shouldn't I know that they have engaged 
either through gangs or on their own, whatever the circumstances of that may have been. Shouldn't I know? Isn't that register important either way? Like the, the, the importance of it being public uh, is, is, is for families. Institutions can get hold of it, schools if they want it. It seems to me they could, uh, they could find out. Uh, I think even under the current regime in relation to adults and so on and so, if they searched. But if there's a register, the register is just an extension because a court is heard in public, uh, deliberations happen in public and the conclusions are in public. If there was just due diligence, even in the case of post office, if the post office uh, did its due diligence, it would know whether its employees have criminal records and what is the nature of those crimes if they just pushed. But I think there are restrictions in relation to, uh, there are bigger, much more bigger restrictions in relation to children. I want to know because uh, this is going to be a, a trick, a, 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 a much more difficult one even to, to, to as it were, sell to society. Uh, and then I know you are balancing it with dignity at, at the center of which is this importance for privacy, this importance for a destigmatization or for a person not to be stigmatized and, and so on and so forth, assuming that our prison systems in any way are corrective. But what happens when it's not a, it's not a it's not useful to register if it's not public and if it only can be accessed by institutions, if it is about sexual offenses, because those sexual offenses happen everywhere. And if you restrict for children, uh, then a family uh, which must know the other family because children are befriending each other and so on and so forth then it's, it's not protected uh, or it doesn't exercise the necessary carefulness to protect itself. Uh, or you, you must engage with that person knowing that this person has this history. And then the second, the second statistic, which I think it's important to underscore this advice is the statistics of repeat offenders. Do, do we have that information? What do we know the level of repeat offenders when it comes to, to sexual crimes? Uh, that may also support the direction which we must take and be decisive about it. Uh, I think these two are, are, are critical. The last, the last point maybe to return to, to the earlier argument around children. Um, is that in no way am I saying uh, we must, I'm asking what you, you think, uh, what is your definitive uh, sort of advice uh, to us? Are you saying we must treat 18 year olds and below completely uh, out of the register of sexual offenders? Or are you saying it must be controlled? If so, controlled how? And, and what about the access of ordinary families and ordinary persons? Um, and then the, that goes, I think, again, to the important statistics in the consideration of if we know the, the levels of, of repeat offenders in South Africa, statistically, if we have that, and I think they might be there, then we know what to say about parole. We also know we have we we also. I was I'm very disappointed at uh, Breitenbach's uh, input here because that history she has of uh, being a prosecutor should assist here. Yeah. That's that's exactly who we need. And maybe if they can, the prosecutors can give us some kind of you know collective information out of which some statistical conclusions can be drawn. Even with parole, we may reach some level of uh, 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 
of, of a structure of some definitive law that we can make. My final comments uh, relate to a much more larger political question, Chairperson. Uh, and here again, I, I just really need to hear what you are. I know you are doing legal advice, but there are serious political issues concerned with imprisonment in South Africa in that incarceration is largely, largely has remained in post-apartheid society, another unfair tool of punishing black people. Uh, they often... I'm sure we are all conversant with uh, those arguments, which in the US as well, that is the case. Uh, majority of the people that get incarcerated and so on and so forth are black people. Does the paper converse those grounds? And if it does, what are the conclusions or what are your what are the advices that uh, you have uh, included? So that when we deliberate, uh, maybe we, you have, we get those tools and we deliberate using those tools, some of which can, can really just be based on, sci on scientifically or statistically derived uh, data. Uh, yeah, those are my, my questions. I hope I'm clear. I know I was long-winded, but I hope I'm, 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 I'm sufficiently clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Andrews. Um, over to you, Dr. Lutz. Thank you, Chairperson, and to you, thank you, honorable members, for the questions. Uh, I just want to note the general concerns through all of them are things that I struggled with while um, approaching this, this opinion and the research. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to try and answer as best I can. Um, I need I needed to with, with in approaching this, I did need to like distinguish subject of an object. If I know the opinion may come across as yes, but by Honorable Horn and Honorable Jale. I'll move, Jay. Yeah, I, I second chair with the, those amendments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Horn moves, seconded by Honorable Jale. The, uh, the minutes are adopted as, amend, as amended. Um, are there any objections? None. Can we move to the last set of minutes? Mr. Chombeni. Thank you very much, Mr. Chombeni. Um, the minutes of the 5th February 2021, the briefing by the Department of Correctional Services, that was the agenda, uh, on the audit committee and internal audits on matters and measures to detect. But those are the minutes of the subcommittee. Um, are, not, are not the minutes of the portfolio committee. Uh, can I be guided by the house? How do we deal with the minutes of the audit of the subcommittee? Um, should we adopt the minutes or we should have a report that should be delivered by the chair um, orally to the committee um, and then maybe then adopt the minutes because now some of us would be uh, dealing with minutes that we are not part of the meeting and we might not even understand the context because mo in most cases uh, the minutes would uh, focus on the decisions, we might not understand the context of what was taking place in that meeting, what, why was a particular decision arrived at. So can I get guidance from the meeting? From the meeting? Okay, Werner, on speaking. Thank you, Chair. Oh. Yeah, I think procedurally you correct um, the, the subcommittee 
if they want to adopt minutes, should do it themselves. And it, mm -hmm. what was agreed as part of the protocol is that the subcommittee would from, from time to time file reports with the portfolio committee. Yes. Uh, thanks, Honorable Hong, Honorable J. Thank you, Chair. I think it, that's my view. Uh, I think you, 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 you gave it the correct guidance. Those minutes belong to that committee. You can't chair uh, precise on the minutes that <laughs> we, uh, belong to some way. But I think one something that I would want to make a comment on, it is the issue of, okay, those minutes belong to that committee and they should be incorporated to the report that they will be presenting to the committee. But I think the issue of, of not, uh, I'm still not clear as to, did we uh, discuss the issue of the time frame where the committee must uh, come uh, to the committee in order to report on those matters? That is the clarity maybe I would want to hear because I don't, I don't remember us discussing that one. Maybe I missed it, Chair. Thank you. Yes did not discuss the frequency, can the chair be mandated to work with the chair of the subcommittee uh, and the committee secretariat to look at the program so that we can get progress reports as to what has been happening in the subcommittee and maybe uh, monthly we get, uh, we allow space in the program where we get a report from the subcommittee as to what they are discussing and uh, so the committee is abreast with what is happening in that subcommittee. Is that agreeable, members? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us uh, to the end of the meeting, unless, yes, chair. unless members have got other issues raise um, but uh, if there are no other issues I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the members for their contribution. I thought this meeting today was going to be very long but you were very focused straight to the point to raise pertinent issues and I think um, I was not expecting that it would be done before two but we have made it possible with we finished before two o'clock. Um, so go and buy your suits uh, for tomorrow and do your hair. Uh, we will meet on Friday. Uh, on Friday, we will be dealing with the complaint. In fact, it's not a complaint, it's uh, what we saw uh, from NCA about the legal aid board. Um, uh, so they'll be appearing before us. Uh, information has been circulated to members. There are responses to the allegations, but I must also say that uh, members should bear in mind that uh, I received, um, in fact, I was in communication before the meeting started with the chairperson of the legal aid board um, that um, they are fine with the responses. The responses from the legal aid board are comprehensive, but those responses have not yet been to the board. Um, the board has not yet met. It was just that uh, proviso that when we look at the report of the legal aid board, we must always bear in mind that it has not been to the board, but uh, it, according to them, it is comprehensive. We will interact with it on Friday. And then we will also deal with the letters that um, have come before us and they will be circulated uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, members. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Uh, thank you.